So in these indeterminate forms, these exponential ones, what we really mean is we're looking at the limit as x approaches a of f of x raised to the power g of x. And so we have these three types. What we're going to do with each of these types of scenarios is once we have something like this and we have a one to infinity type or a zero to zero type, what that means is, so first of all, one, if we have that the limit <coughs> as x approaches a of f of x is one, say, and the limit as x approaches a of g of x is infinity, then this gives us one to the infinity type. Two, if obviously we have that the limit as x approaches a of f of x is zero and the limit as x approaches a of g of x is zero, this is going to give us zero to the zero type. And three, if we have that the limit as x approaches a of f of x is infinity, and the limit as x approaches a of g of x is zero, we're going to get infinity to the zero type. In any of these three scenarios, what we're going to do is we let y equal f of x to the g of x, and then we can apply logarithms to this. When we apply natural logarithms to this, it brings us down. This will give us the natural log of y equals the natural log of f of x to the g of x. The exponent on the inside becomes number on the outside. And then we take the limit of this and the limit of log y and now if this was a one to infinity type say for example then what that did was this is going to go to infinity and then this will go to one which means this will go to Or sorry, it should be one to the infinity. So this is going to go to our log of one is zero. So this will be zero times infinity type once we do log of y. And then once we find this, we get the limit as x approaches a of log y will be some number L. What we have to do with that is interchange by content continuity, we can change limits and log. So this will give us the natural log of the limit as x approaches a of y equals l. And then we exponentiate both sides. Cancel, cancel. This says the limit as x approaches a of y is e to the l. I think this is the one I did last time, but it's been a while, so those are the two that I will do. So example one. We have the limit, or let's yeah, the limit as x approaches zero plus of x to the x. What we have to do with this is assess what kind this is. First of all, this says that this is going to be a, where does x, x is going to zero. Where does x go? Zero. Where does x go? Zero. So this is x to the x. Everything is going to zero. So this is zero to the zero type. So what do we do with this every time? 
I write y equals x to the x, and then we apply natural logarithms. That says the natural log of y equals the natural log of x to the x. I bring the exponent down. This says that the natural log of y is equal to x times the natural log of x. And then I take the limit. This says the limit as x approaches zero plus of log y is equal to the limit as x approaches zero plus of x times the natural log of x. And then what do I have? <clears throat> I reassess this and now I look and this is zero times infinity type. What do I do with those? I do one over one over this clever trick from before and I'm, then I'm gonna get infinity over infinity type. This equals the limit as x approaches zero plus of the natural log of x over one over x. And as I go to zero plus, this is going to go to infinity over infinity type. Now I can use Laputal's rule. So in the exponentiation, the zero to the zero type gets me to zero times infinity type, zero times infinity type. I use the clever trick to turn it into zero over zero, infinity or infinity. Now that I can do that, I can take the derivative of the top and the bottom. This equals by Laputal's rule, the limit as x approaches zero plus of one over x over negative one over x squared, which is equal to the limit as x approaches zero plus of negative one over x is what we're gonna, or sorry, one over one over will give us negative x, which is equal to zero. That's not our limit though. Everybody forgets at the end by the time we get there, this says what? This says that therefore the natural log of the limit as x approaches zero plus of y is equal to zero. So I exponentiate both sides to get rid of the log. And this says the limit as x approaches zero plus of y, which equals the limit as x approaches zero plus of x to the x is equal to e to the zero, which is one. This is our limit. So this is how we compute these exponential types. I have one more yet, let's do example two. Let's do one of the other kinds, but they're all the same. It doesn't matter which kind you have. If you look up here, it doesn't matter which of the three types we have. The strategy is always the same. You natural log, but you call it y, you natural log, you bring the exponent down, you get, uh, you reassess every time, basically. Every time I do the move and I simplify, when I get to here, I know I don't have to use Laputal's rule anymore because it's not, I don't have a fraction, so it's not a zero over zero or infinity over infinity type, so I can just compute the limit. Every time I check, I have to ask myself, once I simplify everything, where am I going zero? Do I have zero over zero or infinity over infinity type? I have to turn it into that in these cases. I start off with zero, zero, and then I get to zero times infinity, right? I start off with a zero over zero type, and then I go to zero times infinity using the logarithm trick. And then by doing the one over one over, I finally get infinity over infinity. And then I take the derivative. If I clean that up and I still have zero over zero or infinity over infinity, I use Laputal's rule again. And I keep using it until I have not a zero over zero or infinity over infinity. I have to check every time. And I don't know how many times I'm gonna have to necessarily do it. So I have the limit as X approaches zero plus again of one plus pi X. Times, oh, that's why cotan x. So where is this going? X is going to zero. So this looks like it is a, and cotan is cos or cosine over sine. So as I go to zero, sine is blowing up. So sine will go, so this is one to the infinity type. 
how do I know that I'm computing the limits? Really what you're doing is the limit as X approaches zero plus of one plus pi X equals one. And the limit as X approaches zero plus of cotan X is equal to infinity. <clears throat> so, therefore, what do I do with this? I write Y equals one plus pi X to the cotan X. And that will imply that the natural log of Y, <clears throat> I'm gonna start skipping the intermediate step. I'm gonna bring it down. This should be cotan X times the natural log of one plus pi X. Now, what is that? If I'm going to take my limits, taking limits, I get the limit as X approaches zero plus of log Y is equal to the limit as X approaches zero plus of cotan X times the natural log of one plus pi X. And where is this going? This is now going to zero times infinity type. Log of one is zero. Cotan is still going to infinity. So I can do one over one over. If I do one over one over cotan, that's just tangent is what I'm writing. So this gives me equals the limit as X approaches zero plus of I leave this one alone because that seems like an easier to derivative to take. And if I do one over the one over the cotan, I'm just going to get tan X. Basically what that means is, I'll show you, it'll be in the video, but this is, should be one over one over cotan X. But one over cotan is tangent. So I'm just writing it as tangent tan X. Why did I do that? Because now that becomes zero over zero type. Once I have zero over zero type, now I can use Lapital's rule to take the derivative. This becomes the limit as X approaches zero plus of, when I take the derivative, I'm gonna get one plus pi X, one over the inside times the derivative of the inside over the derivative of tan, which is secant squared X which is if I clean this up, the limit as X approaches zero plus of pi times co squared X over one plus pi X. Now I ask myself, do I have to use Lavatel's rule again? No, because this is just going to go to equals pi times cos squared of zero over one plus zero, which is pi. Everybody gets so excited, that's not our answer. We have to exponentiate both sides. This says that the natural log of the limit as X approaches zero plus of one plus pi x to the cotan x is equal to pi. So then I exponentiate both sides to get rid of this. And we get the limit as x approaches zero plus of one plus pi x times cotan x or to the power cotan x is equal to e to the pi which we're pretty sure is irrational and transcendental, but it's hard to prove this. Is this number irrational? E to the pi. All right. We can start. Okay, like once I do that. That's funny. I'm just going to wait a second. So now we can switch to, I was fixing my lecture notes and changing changes or making changes. And the fastest way to do that is to 
only do one chapter at a time. So I was just going to use my notes to be like, no, we can use chapter two in integration. And I'm like, oh, chapter two is not there. So it's compiling right now. So in my lecture notes, this is going to be chapter two or techniques of integration. So I'll go through the first one just because we're going to use it for integration by parts. We're going to use this technique right away. And integration by parts is basically double substitution. So the first one technically, or zero, is the substitution rule. Which you've already seen before and was already on our exam. This is not going to go away though. Substitution rule will be sometimes when we do horrible integrals, you have to do substitution rule, then integration by parts, then partial fraction by decomposition, then some other substitution, and then you have to go back to your. So this can get crazy all of a sudden in the type of techniques that we're going to use. What does this say? If I have the integral of a composition where G is the outside, and then somewhere in there, I have to be able to see F. And then also what I'm doing is you need to know how to find the pairs now. I need to know what F and the derivative are. Once I can see this well, especially with these new transcendental functions, I can make the substitution. I insist on W and you'll see why when we do integration by parts, W is going to be F of X. And then DW is F prime of X DX. And in there, sometimes with, and I'll show one like that when we do integration by parts. Sometimes when we do this, we have to solve for, like if you get W equals X squared minus four, then, in, but then there's an extra X squared in there, then what does that make that? That will make W plus four equal X squared. So sometimes you have to manipulate the substitution, which they don't really point out in a lot of the cases in the textbooks. So oh, this is substitution. Then what that says is the integral of g of f of x, f prime of x dx is equal to the integral of g of w dw. And what that does is that puts us back on usually the lexicon of integrals that I should know how to compute. And then I go ahead and compute, or it'll take me to, and at this stage now, it'll start taking me to a different technique of integration. And so I'll do one of these is like one of the ones that, uh, the harder ones now to see are these new transcendental functions they give you. If I give you the integral of one over x log x dx, this is a lot of one overs. The G function here is one over X. And then, so I have to see somehow the fun a function inside another function and then it's derivative. So what this really says is I should make my W equal to log X and then immediately DW is going to equal one over X DX, which is a differential I have. This is liquidation in X is all X's must go. Once I have this, I can make the substitution. This says the integral of one over log X times one over X DX is equal to the integral of one over W DW. And what that's done is now put me onto the lexicon of in W, I should be able to know how to integrate this one over W is the natural log. So this equals the natural log of the absolute value of W plus C. And then I substitute my original variable back in. What was W log of W? So this would be the natural log of the absolute value of the natural log of X plus C. So this is basic substitution rule. 
Uh, let me do this one. Knowing that the integral of one over one plus x squared dx is r tan x plus c, we want to compute the integral of one over x squared plus a squared dx. So all I'm going to use is a basic substitution and then arc tan. So first of all, what I have to do is find out what my substitution is going to be. The best way to do this is I have the integral of one over x squared plus a squared dx. I want a one there instead of an a squared. So I wanted to pull the a squared out, but I don't have one. So what I'm going to do is, yes, I do. I have a squared over a squared. If I multiply by one. What does that give me? That gives me the integral of one, or let's do dx over, what do I have now? I have a squared, and then I have x squared over a squared plus one. So I factored the a squared out of both terms. That gives me, I can take the a squared out of the integral now. And on the bottom, what do I have? I'm going to combine that square x over a squared plus one dx. Now that gives me my substitution. My substitution is going to be w equals x over a. So dw is one over a dx, which I have. I can steal one of the a's or a dw equals dx. You're allowed to manipulate or move the a up if you want. <coughs> Assuming a is not zero. If a is zero, it's not there. And I can integrate this by the power rule. So now what do I do? Using my substitution, this is going to equal one over a squared times the integral of a dw over now w squared plus one which is one over a, the integral of w squared plus one dw. This is now r10. Once I make the substitution, this puts me back on my lexicon of integrals I should know. That's what it even said. It was nice for myself and for you at the beginning. I know now the integral of that thing is r10 of w. So this equals one over a r10 of w plus c. But w was x over a plus c. Please, for all intents and purposes, this is, I will rarely say it, but this is an integral you should start memorizing because it's going to come up all when we do partial fraction de decomposition. All antiderivatives are natural logarithms or arc tangents. We're going to have to do this. We're going to have to complete the square, and then we're going to have to do this business. So we're trying to turn all irreducible quadratics into completion of square in the x squared plus a squared, and then we get rid of the a squared, and this is the formula. The integral of one over x squared plus a squared dx is equal to one over a arc tan of x over a plus c. This is gonna come up quite a bit when we start doing partial fraction decomposition. So there you go. How do I get the formula? Substitution rule, substitution rule. Okay, technique one, integration by parts. I posted assignment two, I forgot about that too, but assignment two, I just posted this morning. So it's, and I made it do an extra day. It says in the course outline, do Saturday at 11. I made it Sunday at 11.59. So you get an extra day because I forgot to post this. So it's up there now. Number one is uh, La Batale's rule. Number two is these beginning integration techniques. So what we're now gonna do is what if we have an integral 
of we have a function now, but not inside another function, and say in the regular substitution, we're looking for the function and its differential or f prime of x dx. What if we have the function and someone else's differential, a g prime of x dx? Then what we're going to do is we're going to make a double substitution. One of them is the regular substitution, and this is where I'll use u. And then one of them is a reverse substitution, like trigonometric substitution, you're going to see an inverse substitution. So what we're going to do is then we're going to let u now for integration by parts, I will use u, be f of x. Then using differentials, du is equal to f prime of x dx. And at the same time, I'm going to make an inverse Substitution now, I'm going to let dv, the differential, already be g prime of x dx. And what they're really saying is if I integrate both of those sides, that will give me the integral of the derivative of g by the fundamental theorem of calculus. Those things cancel each other, so that's just g. And the integral of dv is just b. So you write dv as this and you integrate both sides and you're gonna get phi is g of x. Now what integration by parts says is, the integral of f of x times g prime of x dx is equal to the product f of x times g of x minus the integral of g times f prime of x dx. This is integration by parts. Or in your little mnemonic that you have, if I'm writing this, the integral of u dv, because u is f of x and dv with g prime of x dx is equal to u times v minus the integral of v du. This is integration by parts. So how do we do this? Let's pick one. I'll do that one first and then we'll do this one tomorrow. For example, what am I on? So what do I want to do? I want to use this technique the reason we have this now is because if you know what the integral of x dx is and the integral of e to the x dx, does that mean we know how to integrate x e to the x dx? We don't have a product rule, quotient rule, chain rule. Instead, we have to use integration by parts. So I have, when we're doing this, what you really wanna ask yourself is, eventually this will get harder and harder. Who do I know how to take the derivative of? And who do I know how to take the integral of? Also, when we do this, if you have a polynomial X times a transcendental function, especially let U be the polynomial always, let U equal X, because when I take the derivative, it will disappear eventually, because when I take the derivative of X, I just get one, which will be gone. So I'm going to let u equal x, then du equals dx in this case. I'm gonna let dv equal e to the x dx. When I integrate that, that says v should equal e to the x itself. What does that give me? That tells me that the integral of x e to the x dx should equal u times v, x e to the x minus the integral of v du. And now you see that because I let u be the polynomial, it's gone in this one because it was just x. So I now had to know how to integrate e to the x. 
and this becomes x e to the x minus e to the x plus c. And so the integral of x e to the x dx, they write in the back of the textbook, is e to the x, x minus 1 plus c. Example six. All inverse transcendentals, we can compute their antiderivative using integration by parts. Integration by parts. To find their antiderivatives. What do I mean by that? What's the integral of log x dx or the integral of arc tan x dx? or the integral of sine hyperbolic inverse x dx. They're all going to be computed this way. As an example, I'll do, which one do you want to see? Logarithm or arctan, arctan x. They're all this way, you should practice them. The key is I have the integral of, let's do arctan x dx. Now that I know that I'm cleverly using integration by parts, what I should do is I should ask myself, what do I know how to differentiate and what do I know how to integrate? The whole point is I'm trying to integrate this thing. So I don't know how to integrate arctan, but I know how to integrate just dx. And I do know how to differentiate arctan. So that's what I'm going to make my substitution. I'm going to let u equal arctan x because then du immediately becomes something I know how to compute. The differential or the derivative, the differential will be one over one plus x squared dx. I'm gonna let dv be one dx, something I know how to integrate. So that says v will equal x. This will be the substitution for all inverse transcendentals. Replace this with arc cos or arc sine or arc, or sine hyperbolic inverse, cos hyperbolic inverse, natural logarithms, all of these, any of the inverses of the transcendental functions, this is how I find their uh, antiderivative. I let u equal the inverse transcendental function, then I can differentiate that. I let dv equal dx, and then v is x every single time. So by parts, this now says the integral of arc tan x dx is equal to what? u times v x arc tan x minus the integral of v du, which will be x over one plus x squared dx. And now in this one, guess what? I'm gonna have to use a regular substitution. I'm gonna let w equal one plus x squared, then one half dw equals x dx. And so this becomes equals x arc tan x minus one half the integral of one over w dw. The twos look like l's eventually. What does that give me? This gives me x arc tan x minus one half the natural log of the absolute value of w plus c. I substitute w in. The absolute values can go away now because one plus x squared is positive. If you don't like that, leave the absolute values on there if you want. This becomes x arc tan x minus one half the natural log of one plus x squared plus c. And then the back of the book will probably write x arc tan x minus the natural log of the square root of one plus x squared plus c. I put the exponent on the outside. 
or a number on the outside becomes the exponent on the inside. You don't have to do the last step. I'm just showing you they're just using logarithm laws and the fact that square root is one half. All right. So that technique works for all inverse transcendental functions. This is where we find their inverses. I should do one more probably. Yeah, this guy. What was that? Six, seven. Sometimes the integrals turn into each other. So we have to solve for the appropriate integral. So compute i equals, we're going to call it i, the integral of, yeah, what if I have e to the x and then say cos x dx. So now transcendental times transcendental. I know how to take the derivative of both. I know how to integrate both separately. So now I can use integration by parts to try to compute this thing. But what's going to happen is it's just going to turn into another integration by parts and I'm going to have to do it again. And then when I do that, it turns it back into the integral again. It's like, what's going on? We have to solve for the appropriate integral sometimes. So using substitution the first time, I'm going to let u equal, uh, what did I let it equal here? It doesn't really matter. I'm going to let u equal the trigonometric function because it's easier to integrate e. So cos x. And what that does for me is uh, oh, yeah, because I'm doing the same way. And what does that give me? That gives me du negative du equals sine x dx, or du is, we'll leave it on that side negative sine x dx dv is e to the x dx so v is just e to the x that's my integration by parts but watch what happens that says the integral of e to the x cos x dx is equal to v times u so e to the x cos x minus a minus so plus now the integral of e to the x sine x dx. So the negative canceled because I have a negative in my derivative, in my differential. But now how do I compute this guy? I'm also going to have to use integration by parts and it'll turn it into this integral again. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm going to let u equal sine x and then du equals cos x dx and then dv is going to equal e to the x dx and so v is going to equal e to the x it's like we're going around in a circle so i put that in there so now this says my integral i uh, i'll squeeze it in there i'll show you what i'm doing integral of e to the x cos x dx is now equal to e to the x cos x, but now plus what do I have in that e to the x sine x integral is now equal to what? uv, so e to the x sine x minus the integral of v du which is e to the x cos x dx. That's the green one. But these are the same guys. So I'll move it over. This says two times the integral of e to the x cos x dx equals e to the x cos x plus e to the x sine x plus c as a constant of integration. 
for solving for this, this says the integral of e to the x cos x dx equals one half or e to the x over two times cos x plus sine x plus c. So in this one, I had to solve for the appropriate integral and bring this over and then divide through. Good. How much time do we have left? Okay. So do partial fractions next. And then do trigonometric integrals because that's what we want. Technique two for this course, new technique is going to be trigonometric integrals. In my notes, I have partial fraction decomposition first. There is one of the worst case scenarios of partial fraction decompositions, which actually needs a trigonometric integral substitution. And so the strategy is going to be in most textbooks are going to have trigonometric integrals and then trigonometric substitution next. So this will be trigonometric integrals. For trigonometric integrals, there's going to be three major categories. I'll go over gory detail, the first two categories, and then uh, cotan, cosecant is off is identical up to a negative for the same strategy as uh, secant and tan. And the reason I focus on sine and cosine and secant and tan, and not the third case of cosecant and cotan is for trigonometric substitution, when we get these square roots of the radicals of x squared minus a squared or plus minus, we can turn everything into products of sine and cosine and secant or tan, and then we have techniques of integrating these. You'll get there by Thursday, you'll see what I'm talking about. So there's three major categories. There's going to be There's three main categories of trigonometric integrals. That we're going to cover. The first one will be the integral of all powers sine n x and cos m x dx. Or m and n are integers. There's going to be the integral of tan n x and secant m x dx. And those are the major two. I can turn everything from when I do trigonometric substitution, not trigonometric integrals, I can turn trigonometric substitution into the first two categories. I never really need the third category, but there also is cotan n x and cosecant m x dx. These are the three major categories of integration that we want to do. where always M and N are in the natural numbers. They don't have to be, at least one of them does. You can have actually exponents, as long as one of them is a natural number, one of them can be an irrational number. I'll get into those eventually. But, in the last two minutes, let's start the strategy of what we're going to do. One, the integral of sine nx and cos mx dx. Basically, there's four subcategories. One, n equals 2k plus 1 is odd, and m equals 2l is even. And I'll, I'll show you starting on Thursday, I'll show you how to deal with all these categories. Then the second case is the reverse of that. If I have that n is 2k even and m is 2l plus 1 is an odd number. And then three. What if they're both odd? That'll be the best case scenario. So 
than the worst case scenario or which we'll have to go over, which is gonna need an entirely different technique is going to be when N is 2K even and when M is 2L is even. This is the danger case. This will use a slightly different technique. What we're gonna use for the first three of these is we're going to use the Pythagorean identity, co squared x theta plus sine squared theta equals one. So sine squared theta equals one minus co squared theta, and co squared theta equals one minus sine squared theta. This is what we're going to use. For the danger case, what we're going to use is, we're going to use that sine squared theta equals one half one minus cos two theta, and cos squared theta equals one half one plus cos two theta. These are the techniques that we're going to use. So we're done for the day, but this is where we're going to go. And I can show you quickly if you have a minute to stay. If you have to go, that's fine. For category one, or for the first category, if we have the integral of sine 2k plus 1x times cos 2l x dx, what should we do with this? What we're gonna do is, is use an exponent law. I've stolen this one. So using the exponent laws, sum on the, in the exponent is product in the basis. So I'm stealing this, but now I have a differential. I want to let that be my differential dw. So what should I make w then? So I know that w is going to be cos x. And then that's technically going to be negative dw. So negative dw should equal sine x dx. Well, how do I get rid of the rest of the signs? This is going to be the integral of sine squared x to the k times cos 2lx times sine x dx. I now use the trigonometric identity up here. And I let this equal one minus cos squared x to the power k times cos two L x, it didn't matter. This is just an M times sine x dx. I can now make the substitution. This becomes negative the integral of one minus w squared to the k times w to the m dw. And now I can use binomial theorem to expand all of this out. Yeah. So what I'm doing is you're viewing it as sine, but what that means is sine x is to the 2k plus one, which is equal to sine x to the 2k times sine x to the one, which we usually don't write. And I'm just stealing it. And so as soon as it's odd, this is why those three first cases are easy. As soon as you have one of the exponents of the sine or cosine is odd, you just take that, you just take that one and then that gives you the differential. But now I have to get rid of the rest of the substitution. So I have to get rid of the rest of the signs. So I had an odd sign. And in this case, I had no choice. If they're both odd, you can use whichever one you want, but I'm focused on this one. So what I do is first I break it into these two pieces. But now that's the rest of the signs have to go away. So I turn them into coses. Now I have all cos and I have the differential for cos and I can make a substitution and I can get rid of it. That'll happen for the, all three cases. 
if cos is odd, you steal the cos off and you make the substitution as W will be sine X. And then you have the substitution, you get rid of all the, all the other coses, and then you have substitution for sine. If they're both odd, pick whichever one you want. If they're both even, uh, watch out. We're gonna have to use an entirely different technique. We'll do that on Thursday. And I'll have the midterms marked by then. So have a good day. We'll continue this on Thursday, but this is the strategy. The first three cases are roughly the same. As soon as one of the exponents is odd, steal it, and you have your differential. Use the Pythagorean identity to get rid of all the rest of your sines or cosines, depending on which one you've made the substitution. Then you can make your substitution into W, and now it's just the power rule, boil everything out. If it's in both even, we're going to have to use a slightly different substitution, the ones in red, and then we will deal with that on Thursday to see how we do that. And then we have the other kinds, and then we'll do trigonometric substitution as well. So see you on Thursday.